All right, Flynn Southam, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, mate. You've uh, had a busy week and you're just coming off the back end of making the Australian team for the World Championships. Congratulations on that. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a pretty hectic week and um, good to be back home and see the family again and probably catch up with my mates a bit towards the end of this week and just go out for some nice dinners. But yeah, a bit of a reset for the rest of this week and back into it next week. You were just telling me just off camera a second ago, just in terms of your day yesterday, and I found that interesting, right? Like once you do end up making the Australian team, they make this big announcement. From the from the moment they announce, kind of walk us through the next 24 hours, can you? So we had the team announcement um, on the final night, and then, you know, everyone usually goes out for dinner or just like a nice little celebration. And then we come back in the next morning and, few of us will have media. I saw Ariane Timmis and Lani there doing a couple of interviews and then I had some and pretty much if you have that, you'll have that. But around 10 o'clock, we'll come in and kind of announce the rookies and we get paired up in buddies. Uh, mm. We get I was with Alex Graham, he's kind of a veteran of the team and we just had a little chat and had a few team bonding sort of stuff. Not, not too much that we can go into, but a lot of it's just like about the team culture and how we can move forward as a you know, connected team. And it's pretty cool to be a part of that. And I remember like my first O day last year, like it's, it's pretty special to be a part of. Yeah. It's, it's a smaller team uh, than we usually take to the world championships. How do you feel yeah. about that? Um, It is what it is. It's, I trust the coaches and they're the decision makers process, you know, they're, they're yeah. they know what they're doing. The yeah. relay teams look really good. That's the main thing. I think Um, we've probably got quality over, quantity this year which isn't always a bad thing but you know we've got a really strong team and I'm you know pretty thankful to be a part of it yeah I think maybe in the lead up to the championship a lot of talk about the women's four by one but not much mm. talk about the men's I felt probably a lot of people around the world were thinking that the men's Aussie team wasn't going to be as strong this year and then all of a sudden you know Kyle pops you bang. pop um bang you know yeah you got, you got a bunch of guys there that kind of produced uh, including yourself which is which is brilliant first time under under 48 for you so you guys have got to be feeling good just as a team now yeah well i was saying to kyle and i said in a few interviews before like it was just so cool to be a part of that freestyle um 100 freestyle in the marshalling room because it felt like we're all teammates and i think the culture there's been a real culture shift especially since like maybe 2012 to like around that era in comparison to now everyone's like on the same line and we all have we're on the same wavelength and we want to hold each other accountable and the team culture moving forward is getting a gold medal for the relay and being as good as what the girls are mm. and i think when we all kind of choose relay success over individual success and we're there to help each other out rather than you know undermine each other that's when you know something special happens and that's that's the team culture we've got right now that, that's an interesting shift too because i don't think uh you and kyle weren't always best of buddies in the past couple of years it seemed like there was a little bit of rivalry there but it seems like you guys have really connected and bonded now and and maybe the relationship has shifted a little yeah well i mean it's always with me and kyle it's always going to be competitors first but you know it's nice to have someone to send a message and be like hey i'm not feeling well or hey how do i work my turns a bit better and He's always going to be there and that's that's his oh. responsibility he's taken upon himself and you know for me now that's going to be me within the next five years to help the next flynn south and through you know yeah so we had a national event camp at the start of the year it was just like a training camp with all the potentials and possibles and probables to make the team oh. and it was like split into little different groups and we had like men's hundred freestyle group and me and Kyle, Kyle would stay back every second session with me and would spend half an hour in the water and he'd like literally be demonstrating like how he does, you know, a specific skill, whether it's just starts or dives or um, starts or turns, sorry. Um, yeah, and that was pretty cool to be a part of. And, you know, I learned so much in a week. So whenever I go away with him, or, you know, it's not just Kyle, it can be the girls as well because, you know, they're the best in the world. So it's a lot of mental stuff that you learn, not just the physical skill sets. Mate, it was around uh, the same age you are now that Kyle won his Olympic gold, you know. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it, it's definitely possible to be the fastest swimmer in the world at your age. Do you kind of have visions of that for yourself now? 
Yeah, well, that's the goal at the end of the day to be the best in the world. But at the same time, I know that for me personally, it's not about winning this year. It's about being the best next year. Everyone's on their different, their own path. Kyle won when he was 18. Thorpe won when he was, you know, 15 to 17. David, you know, he broke the world record when he was 17. But then you see some swimmers who are a bit older or in their mid 20s, that that's when they really come into fruition. Like Cam McAvoy, I think he was 23 three maybe 22 when he broke um the textile world record so you know it whatever it is at the end of the day but you know for me i'm just trying to be better than i was yesterday and i often fall into the trap of you know comparing myself to other swimmers but at the end of the day i don't swim to beat anyone else i just swim to be better than what i was yesterday you've been you've been coming on for a while mate like there's been a lot of talk about you for a couple of years now you've been you've been really good since you were 15 and so for for someone to kick on and and continue to make jumps forward it's fairly unusual like when you're that good that young it's very difficult to continue to get faster and continue to get better you just seem to have done that um have there been any setbacks over the past couple of years for you at all yeah, there's so many, you know, there's like the, the daily, you know, kind of injury that will always come about or there's like some major ones, like some loved ones passing away or, you know, just some real disappointing swims or, you know, this stuff. Everyone deals with setbacks, but it's about how you can overcome those stuff. And I have in my Instagram bio, like the comeback is stronger than the setback. That's like my kind of little philosophy mm. that I live by. Mm. Um, and, you know, yeah, so there's so many I could go towards, like saying an injury or, you know, just some confidence stuff or, you know, being in lockdown in 2020. Mm-hmm. That was pretty interesting for me. I've spoken about this before. I went into it as 14, um, weighed like 68 kilos, came out, just turned 15 year old, still the same height. And I put on 20 kilos of like fat. Like I was like, <laughs> like big, big boy. Um, you know, I just like, yeah, there's stuff like that, but you know, I just treat them all the same and just, you know, realize that I'm not defined by setbacks. I'm defined by how I overcome those setbacks. Where, where's this come from, mate? Like you, you seem to be very mentally strong. Where, where has that come from? Well, it's probably just my competitive nature, really. Like knowing that my physical skill set is what it is. Um, you know, everyone's working as hard as they possibly can. Like everyone who wants to win pushes their body to the like limit. And there's only so far you can push your body before it, like there's not much more benefit coming out of it. So there's so much mental training you can do to be the best you. And it just comes from a love for the sport. You know, yeah. I've always loved being in the water. I just have always wanted to get faster. I want to swim faster. I just want to enjoy the sport. So for me, it's about how do I swim fast, but at the same time, how, how do I, you know, be happy and how do I, you know, enjoy it? Because I think there's a direct correlation in between those two. You can't really, it's not really sustainable if you're hating the sport and trying to swim fast at the same time. I've done that. I did that for like uh, six months, you know, and that, that really burnt me out and made me want to quit swimming. So for me, it kind of was like resetting, like, why do I actually want to do this? What am I chasing? Why am I chasing it? So yeah, it's just about that. I think the love for the sport. You don't seem to be afraid to kind of verbalize, um, you know, either your struggles or or the, the times where you're feeling very confident too, you know, like you, you're you okay with saying how you feel about yourself and the confidence that you have in yourself and that kind of shines through a lot. Um, is that something that you've always had with you? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I'd like, you know, be really in my shell, like not want to speak about anything, just full, you know, not not like afraid of you know verbalizing anything but for me when i would have really tough times i'd come on to like you know podcasts like this or watch kobe or watch michael phelps or any of like the goats in sport or goats in life you could say and you know how they kind of came out of their shell just so they could talk about their struggles and you know what made them as good as what they are i think that like that's really powerful to see that and i think it would probably be a dishonor to the sport if you know i wasn't to share my story because there's going to be some little kid watching that one day being like you know i want to be like that like i was to you know thorpey or kyle or cam you know so i think it's kind of about continuing that kind of cycle of life i guess for swimming australia what about the confidence side of it then like it's it's okay to share the struggles you know that that feels 
a little bit safer, you know, because you're just being honest and true. But like, actually, most of us are afraid of how good we can be, right? Like, and we don't want to verbalize that because, you know, you don't want to say how good you might be or how good you are. And so, but you seem to be comfortable with that too. Um, Well, I think I, because I understand the difference between confidence and arrogance. I believe confidence is when you're promoting yourself and arrogance is when you promote yourself by putting other people down. Right. So I I doubt, I hope I will never say on a podcast or anything like, oh, I'm going to win this race. I'm going to go this time. Like, I'm just going to be the best in the world. Like, that's not my style at all. Like, I'm going to be like, I know I can do the best swim I can do there because I work for it every day. I leave no stone unturned. Like, because I focus on my internal dialogue and myself, that's, I feel like that, that gives me confidence and that's how I can express my confidence because I'm just being myself at the end of the day. Yeah. I'm not putting up a front when I kind of come into these interviews. Like if someone was to ask me on the street or at the pool, you know, I'd answer it the same way. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. What about a young world record holder who's just a, just a few years ahead of you uh, now in uh, David Popovich? Do you spend some time kind of studying him a little bit? Um, yeah, like, you know, it's always like I'll look at Dressel's dive, Kyle's back end, um, you know, David's technique. You kind of take little chunks from everyone's game and you kind of yeah. incorporate into that in yourself. But like I said before, I, you know, I've fallen victim to getting in that mindset where it's like, oh, try and swim like David or try and swim like Kyle, right. you know. Yeah. And yeah. That's when my technique just goes to crap. Like that's when I start bobbing up and down in the water and just not going anywhere. Out. It's like I try too hard and yeah, lose connection. So for me, it's just about, you know, I love what Megan May says, like be you, right? you know, right? like just at the end of the day, you, you are who you are and you can't change that. So why and try and be anyone else? But, you know, just take the little things from everyone's game and, you know, at the end of the day, just be yourself. Well, tell me about you then. What are, what are your strengths? What do you, where do you get your confidence in terms of, you know, the, the training kind of sets it up, but like, where are you skilled? You believe, where are you good? It seems to me that you, you've got a really nice back end in all of your races. So is that, is that part of your confidence? Yeah, it's part of my confidence, uh, physically wise, like confidence wise, um, for my yeah physical confidence wise, like, mm. It would be my training and my work ethic, what I do day in and day out. I used to have the worst turns in the race. There's, I'll have to send you a video of trials last year. I hunted free. They had the video camera underwater and it showed me pushing off the wall. And I did like a duck glide and a kick and I just came up straight away. Mm. And I'd have the worst breakouts, worst dives, get pumped off the dive. And, you know, they're still not the greatest by any means, but they've made a big shift. So physically just working my skills every day even in the slow turns just whipping my feet around off the wall and you know that's that that's what gives me confidence like with the physical aspect but the mental aspect for me when people ask me like how do you become confident it's like why would you just not back yourself to the end of the world you know yeah like yeah. your your worst out your greatest ally and your worst enemy is your mind so right. if you can the sooner you can control that and control your emotions the better it's going to be for you to you know come back from those little setbacks or set yourself up for success yeah so it's but like you ca- you're catching on to that early mate that's a good thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, i've caught a uh, speaking of the physical i've caught a glimpse of your hand a couple of times just in on camera you got big hands man yeah, they, they seem big, but, um, you know, well, short course, I think I walked past. Uh, I think I actually gave Tom Check on a handshake and his hands like wrapped <laughs> all the way around mine. So I was like, well, I'm still a baby in comparison to these big Italian guys. <laughs> now, in terms of your strength, and you, you say you're a baby, you're still young. And so you're still developing your, your man strength, I, I would say. Uh, you're still growing into yourself a little bit. So how are you how are you getting strong what are you doing for your strength um so we've got a new gym guy he's not new he came in at the start of last year um when chris mooney really came down to bond and i actually worked through him through my school sports program he was you know the head of the ufc and chinese strength and conditioning team like he's awesome joseph coin he's Mm -hmm. like he's the man he knows everything i love joe um but our program our program is just getting like strength and applying that into the pool and being injury free and i think if you know 
I'm not really too sure of the science behind it and all that, but we do a lot of pull-ups, a lot of, you know, power stuff and, you know, just getting the right amount of strength without having put on too much muscle, you know? How, how often are you in the gym? So what we do is around when, like in a normal training block, we'll have like Wednesday and Friday morning, we'll have one strength session, one power session. So those two are in the gym. Okay. And then Monday morning, we'll have like a little gymnastics circuit. Mm -hmm. So that's like some animal crawls, like some functional movement hanging upside down from the bar. I think Cam McAvoy's posted a few things on his Instagram doing like the front hold lever things. Um, We do similar stuff to that on a Monday morning and, you know, we'll activate our wrists and keep our wrists kind of, you know, strong and mobile and injury free. So lots of that kind of stuff. And it's unique. It's innovative. It's, um, you know, we're not copying the same old textbook that's been used a million times. We're, you know, like I said, taking stuff from that, taking stuff from all these different programs and putting it into our own. And that's led by Chris Mooney, who, you know, is the, there's a method to the madness with Chris. Now, how long have you been with Chris? So he came down to Bond after the Olympics in 2021. He was with Kaylee and then they kind of split up and, you know, he came down to Bond and, you know, he's really eager to do what he did with Kaylee with me. So, you know, I trust, I trust him to the end of the earth. I trust Kyle Samuelson, our other coach and Xander Hay. I trust him as well, growing up with those guys. And then I kind of moved into Chris's squad and that was like a new squad. He brought people from all around Australia that and that he came down in october or september 2021 and it's kind of been like i've never looked back since then you know wow so you 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 primarily swam the 100 200 where do you feel more comfortable right now well i've seen some people say that my it's either like my hundreds on and then my 200s off or my 200 is on and my hundreds off and it kind of depends on me but for me it's literally just like depends on the day it feels like um, kind of have two different kind of strategies for the 100 and 200, but at the moment it's the 100. But if you could ask me that in a week's time, and it could be the 200. So I'd definitely say those two over the 50, especially. So yeah, it comes down to the day. How do you balance the training between the two? You know, they're, they're two completely different races uh, these days. I mean, the 100 is, is very much a power event. A lot of the top guys are coming back on that second 50 very strong which which you are too but um the 200 is a different event so how do you balance the two types of training yeah so for me um what we do at bond is just like a lot of anaerobic capacity stuff and getting be able to swim fast when we need to swim fast and then if we're not trying to swim fast we're trying to swim slow and good technique and we're kind of relying on that anaerobic capacity and the technical fitness to carry me into the 200 it's not like i'm doing you know, two K's extra a session or something like that. Cause at bond where a lot of, it's kind of real specific hundred work and, mm. you know, I trained for the 200 and then for say leading into trials, me and young Miller Jansen in our squad, she's, you know, 50, 100, 200. So we would do maybe a K extra a day, um, you know, three weeks out leading into trials. Cause everyone else in the squad is more like 50 and hundred swimmer. Just kind of some soft yardage. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, like at Bond, it's pretty much either we're going fast, we're going flat out, or it's real easy, controlled, slow, skillful swimming. What what kind of work do you do when you're going flat out? Give me an example of a of a workout. So Chris loves his dive thirty fives and his dive fifties. Mm. Um, so it will be literally. Um, sounds like you love the same yeah. sort of sets. I think. Mm, yeah. Um, it will be between six to nine efforts, and it's just like on maybe three to four minutes cycle dive suited. We suit three times a week. Wow. Um, you know, we have the philosophy that racing is the best training. Right. So I raced a lot over the like second half of last year and a lot over the first half of this year. And that kind of one, it kind of gives me a really good anaerobic capacity base, like real good power base. But then it also, you know, if I'm trying my hardest in those races, I know where my weaknesses are and coming into national age and open nationals back in April on the Gold Coast, it was literally like, we're going to do a, you know, fairly decent taper for this, you know, see where our game is flawed, see where it's really strong. And we'll go back to the drawing board and still have two months in between there and trials. So that's what we did. And 
you know, it paid off and the skills got better, the front end speed got better and overall confidence just got better by doing that. Yeah, mate. You're coming back regularly in in 24 low to mid now. You know, you're you're in that range where the Popoviches, the you know, the Chalmers, top, the top guys in the world are kind of there. And, and and they've created some separation with some other boys. So like once you're getting into that 24 low back end, you're you're really able to swim over the top of people. Is that is that your game plan? Yeah. Well, my game plan and my strength is I think you should. Kind of my idea is that you should race to your strengths, but train to right. your weaknesses. Okay. Yeah. So you know I'll train like my dives, my front ends, my turns, like all that stuff. That's you know the vulnerability for me at the moment, but right. you know, I race my best races are when I come home, like you said, in the 24 low 24 mid. So for me, it's just about controlling that first 50, you know, not spending too much energy, but you know, being up with those guys, seeing myself up in a good position and just coming off that wall, relax a few strokes and bring the animal last 35. Bring the animal. I love it. Well, what about breathing pattern? This this has come up a lot recently uh, yeah. for the 100 freestylers. Um, it used to be kind of like the top 100 freestylers would kind of take one breath the first 25 and then they'd get into kind of every four and then maybe every two. That seems to have shifted now. Like a lot of the top 100 freestylers are breathing every other stroke. Is that your game plan? Yeah. So, I mean, I started off when I had like my breakout swims, I'd start off you know, breathing fours that first lap and then kind of breathing twos, the third for 25 and then right. kind of head down the last 25. Yeah. But at the start of this year, I was like, you know what, my front end speed's not really getting any better. I kind of wasn't really trusting that it would come. So I started chasing that first 50 and I'd like try and be breathing twos like all the other really good guys in the world are. And yep. that's just not my style. Um, my rate would, I'd either spin my rate or, I'd, you know, just lose all my connection so i would do that and then my front end would only be like 0.1 0.2 better but then my back end would just suffer and yeah you know it's obviously it would suffer a bit more because of you know not tapered not shaved or anything but it was just too much of a kind of trade-off for that tiny bit faster on the front end for a bit slower on the back end so i was breathing twos that first 50 the entire of this year until trials i was like i'm going back to my old game plan like i was swimming you know i was trying to swim like david or trying to swim like kyle right, and right. like i said before it doesn't work for me so i just went back to my breathing fours i think i'm you know if i could kind of compare my swim to someone else's historically it would be cam mcavoy when he was you know doing the hundreds yeah um you know just like that breathing fours that good rhythm and connection and you know not forcing it and not muscling it but just a lot of finesse i think yeah, mate. You just uh, you mentioned Ken McAvoy, and and he had a phenomenal uh, meet. You know, going twenty one two in the fifty looks looks incredible. Do you think you guys will will try and convince him to um, step up for the hundred for the relay at, at Worlds, or or are you just leaving him alone? Um. Yeah. Well, I think Cam is so much of an asset that it would be hard for him. It'd be hard for us not to have him, you know, because yeah. he's got like, he's that generational talent. He's got the brains. He's got the, you know, the power now, especially. And he's just got leadership as well. He's kind of like that silent kind of lead by example sort of yeah. dude. Yeah. And that's pretty admirable. And I think um, what we're going for in this relay is more just about the team camaraderie and trusting each other rather than just like, oh, who's who's the best swimmer? Put those best four guys in and forget about everyone else, you know? yeah yeah so it's thing like that and even if he was just a heat swimmer in the relay like you know we treat that like he's like a relay member you know and that's like yeah. the culture we're going for yeah mate the four, the four by one used to be american domination it seems like uh i i couldn't even tell you who's gonna be on that four by one for america right now i mean obviously the the trials are going to come around next week and we'll We'll find out but it doesn't seem to be as u.s dominant anymore do you do you feel like the world has caught up to where the u.s were yeah in a way yes um you know everyone has their moments where the like you know kind of everyone has their good moments and their bad moments especially australia we've had you know great olympics like 2000 and then tokyo yeah. and, you know we've had some dry errors as well but you know it's like what gives it value is that you can't have, you know, if everyone was just winning all the time, it would be like, Oh, good job. But you know, those wins are extra sweet when there's so much like, 
you know, of that dry era and then you come out of that on top. So I think yeah. you can never, never underestimate the Americans, especially I learned that at Junior Pan Packs. They're, you know, they're, they're legit. Whether they've got, you know, one, two, three, four swimmer in the world in the hundred, they will be, even if they don't, I mean, um, they'll still be up there medal, meddling in that four by one for sure, I think. Yeah. Mate, a lot of a lot of people around the world just want to know what the Aussie women are doing. I mean, the, the Aussie women... Uh, are just so deep in the hundred free right now. Is there? Can you give us any insights into why? Um, I think it's I think it's a cultural thing when they when the younger girls because it's not like they always have or well, they actually do have like four of you know the best hundred freestylers in the yeah, world. Yeah, you know, around like they do. four of the girls in Australia around mm -hmm. like the top ten in the world. Yeah, but I think it's because they keep having younger girls that just keep coming through, keep coming through and keep yeah. wanting to get on that team. Yeah. I think it's because, you know, those little kids on the couch watching trials at home, see those girls, um, watch the Olympics. They see them smash a world record and smash the field by like 10 meters or something crazy. So mm. I think it's them wanting to be on that team and, you know, realizing that they have to work to get on that team because it's so good. I think that's why they're the best relay team in the world, you know, the past like yeah. five years or however many years it's been. So yeah. hopefully we can do that us boys can do that and you know rev up some young guns to come through will you guys get together and and talk about the relay will you work on it together like will there be an emphasis on kind of bringing the team together as a unit yeah i, I think there will be in staging camp we'll do a couple of relay kind of sessions where we just focus on those changeovers but i don't think it, there will be like a you know documentary moment where we get get <laughs> together in the rain or anything like that um <laughs> But um, no, because we've all got the same goal. We want to win and, you know, and we're all there to make the sacrifices and we're all on the same line. So I think when you have that and you're fundamentally all there wanting to win, then it will pay off at the end. What would be the ideal spot for you if you could pick the the leg that you'd want to go? Where would Where would you feel most comfortable? Well, obviously everyone wants to anchor, but having Kyle as your anchor is one of the best moves you can have in a relay because yeah, he can yeah. be the same level of fitness. He can lead off, but then he'll also anchor and he'll like love the anchor spot so much more that you'll go so much faster. Right? Yeah, yeah. So for me, for me, it's like knowing that Kyle, Kyle's the man on the anchor and yeah. you know, that will be my position one day. But for me right now, it's like, I love the lead off spot. I had that a bit last year and some, relays at junior pan packs i let off both the four by one and four by two um and then also at com games i let off the four by one and you know there's sometimes some some of the guys are a bit afraid to lead off because they can compare their pbs on a individual event to the relay pbs and no one really wants to be held accountable like that but for me i'm i'm frothing at the mouth to lead off because everyone's kind of you know not just saying australia but around the world people are afraid to lead off and yeah. not have that real thing and i want to be there to give us give our team the best best possible chance of winning and then get out on pool deck and cheer like crazy so <laughs> i like yeah. that i like that you put your pr that pressure on yourself i like that you also give the respect to kyle because look i don't I don't know anyone in the world that's a better anchor than him right now. He, he'll swim over the top of anybody that, that he needs to. He's a beast on the back end. But uh, you gave him that respect. I like that. Yeah, and that's that's the thing with me and Kyle, that we respect one another. And obviously, I'm coming through. I'm hunting him, and he's being hunted in Australia. But it's their mutual respect, and that's more important than anything else. You were pulling up on him uh, in the in the hundred. It was kind of surprising that you know when when Kyle gets out in front like that, you don't see too many guys pull him back. But in that last 10, 15 meters at trials, you would you were certainly pulling him back. Could you feel feel that? Yeah, well, I could see kind of out the right hand side of like he was in on my right side when we were coming back, and yeah, yeah. you know I could see that I was physically making distance on him, and there was only like maybe 25 or 20 meters left. And I'm thinking like, I'm still with him. I couldn't see anyone when I'd breathe out to the left. Like yeah. I was just hoping that Jack on the other side of him wasn't in front of me. And I just kept putting my head down and kept, you know, getting that connection and rating up through there. And, you know, then I looked over, I saw a scoreboard. I'm only like less than 0.3 behind him. I was kind of like a bit of a shock, but I was just so happy to do that with Kyle. Like 
you know, one of my childhood heroes to, you know, actually be in contention with him and going over to Japan with him for the same race. Can you really remember what was going through your head at that time? Was there any self-talk going on? Was it, was it, was yeah. it stay connected to the stroke or was it actually looking at Kyle and, and saying to yourself, like, run him down, run him down? What was actually, what was going through your head? So for me, it's kind of a funny juxtaposition between the 200 free, which is at the start of the meet, which I had actually been training for that 200. I wanted to win that race. I wanted to go, you know, much faster time, but I stuffed up the pacing. I had a bad race and I accepted that and moved on. I was pretty disappointed, but, you know, I had my 100 free final 48 hours later. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to actually put pressure on myself and say, I'm not on the team. Number five spot doesn't give you, Mm-hmm. You know, it it might have, might not have, if yeah. I had just gotten that. But right. I was like, okay, my back's against the wall now in this hundred free. Right. I've just got to go out there and swim like I've got nothing to lose, and that's what I did. I went out there in marshalling. I was actually I was saying this to someone the other day that I was smiling in marshalling because I was like, you know what, I'm not swimming like I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders. I'm just swimming like I've, you know, like it was school regionals or something. And I saw in marshalling. There was all the little like 10 to 13 year old kids um, holding the buckets with all of our like jumpers and stuff in there. Mm. And, you know, they were just smiling, seeing me and Kyle and Matt Temple. And, you know, I just put a smile on my face and I was just smiling in the marching room when everyone's, you know, getting their goggles and caps on, trying to put on that gladiator front. And I was just like bouncing around smiling. And, you know, there's a few camera shots of me before I actually got into the pool. Um like smiling, like literally before they said, take your marks. And I was just like, you know, I was just enjoying it and I let instincts kick in and, you know, I do work each day and turned out to be a good race. Let's go back even a little bit further than the marshalling area. Um, in warmups, you, you know, you, you, you swam a 47 for the first time right at this meet. So yeah. is, is, did you know that in warm up? Did you feel it in warm up or how, what's going through your head in, in the warm up? So I kind of learned at trials last year that just because you have a good warm up or a bad warm up doesn't mean crap for when you get up to race. Right. How how I feel has no no correlation between how I perform. Right. You know, that's because historically I've had good warm ups and then I've swum like crap, and then right. I've had bad warm ups and swum PBs. You know, right, right. And I've had entire meets where I haven't felt connected. I haven't felt you know that feeling. And I've still swum all time PB. So I don't really rely on the feeling or how I feel in the warm up. At the end of the day, you're warming up to warm up for a race. It's kind of more how you feel in the race that matters. Like if I'm, you know, a bit tired in warm up, I'm like, okay, I'm a bit tired. Just got to go out there and race. Like I'm here to, I'm here to swim well. I'm here to race well, not here to warm up well, you know? So you don't put too much thought or feeling into the the feelings themselves like the feelings are there it might be like i feel amazing or i feel terrible but you're still kind of like doesn't really matter how high or how low i feel i'm just i'm I'm here and i'm I'm getting ready for my best swim yeah that's you couldn't put it better yourself like if you're always going around relying on your feelings and letting your feelings dictate your actions not only in swimming but in life like you're not going to get anywhere because of something I've learned is that our feelings are designed to keep us alive. They're survival mechanisms and we haven't evolved past that. Um, So we're not, you know, the society we live in, it's not like a survival, like fight or flight 24 seven, you know, we have, Mm. we can get Uber Eats in 20 minutes, you know, so (laughs) it's not really like that, but I just don't really rely on those emotions and especially, you know, having, highs and lows throughout the sport and I'm I'm sure the Olympics are 10 times more you know the pressures and the nerves and the excitements and the disappointments than you know Australian trials so I don't get too attached to my emotions in that regards yeah I love uh one of my favorite quotes from from one of my favorite UFC fighters Colby Covington he says it's the ultimate fighting championship not the ultimate feeling championship <laughs> he doesn't doesn't put too much weight into the feelings and he puts more yeah, weight exactly. into the fight itself yeah 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 um what's what's your first memory of watching the Olympics at home which one what was my it? first memory um was probably begging mum 
to have the day off school to, you know, sit at home and watch the men's hundred free in 2016. Uh, you know, because Cam did, was did mum say okay? And, yeah, she said okay. <laughs> I think I, I think I had to do a few chores at home, whether it was like, you know, do the do the dishes for a week or something like that. <laughs> but I ultimately got the day off for 47 seconds worth of swimming. But it was so inspirational and you know, what Cam did at trials, we're all rooting for him. And, yeah. you know, him being from the same club at me at that point, we were really excited for him. And then it kind of turns out like this Kyle Chalmers guy just won. And we're like, who is he? Like, we've never even really heard of him before. We just thought he was like kind of like a lottery pick and lottery yeah. to get onto the team. And mm. then we went back through like the age records and all that. And he has like every freestyle record, like <laughs> 50, 100. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool memory when you have that that first real impactful Olympic memory. It, it, it kind of it sticks with you, doesn't it? You want that you want that taste yourself, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And I remember when I was a little kid, I was like, okay, these are the Olympics that I'm gonna you know sit at home and watch properly. And then I ended up forgetting all of them anyway. But then that that moment in Rio actually stuck with me. Are you on track? Like, if you were to look at the year coming, right? Yeah. Are you on track? Are you feeling like I'm in a good spot? I'm going to continue to do what I need to do. Or are you looking at this and saying, I really got to make some adjustments here to be where I want to be by Paris? Um, no, the only adjustments are the ones that, you know, I work on with my coaches. I trust them more than I trust myself sometimes, you know, I have mm. so much faith in the process and, you know, I got, there's this quote, like having faith is like believing in something as though it already existed. Right. So right. I believe that the work we do at Bond is going to get me to where I want to be by Paris. And I believe it like it's already happened, you know? Yeah, that's great. That's great to be in a good spot uh, the year out. I got, for me, going into Sydney 2000, I was... I was like freaking out. I was like, I've got to do something different here. I'm not going to make this team. So you're in a you're in a beautiful spot. You're in, you're in a spot where you're like, I got the right coaches around me. I got the right family yeah. environment. I got the right people. You know, everything's in in place. I just got to come in and do the work now, right? Yeah, and that's I can't be more thankful for that because without like obviously you know the family at home supporting me every day and then the coaches showing up and putting you know hundred percent of their effort in because there's coaches, you know, that will show up and just write stuff on a board and leave, but they're, you know, always available for me to call if I have any problems. Like they're just, they're so committed and it's just so cool to be a part of that. Mate, the, the Aussie team is made up of about 75% swimmers and, and coaches from, from Queensland. Why, why is Queensland so dominant right now? Well, I think you can put it down to a lot of different reasons. You can put it down to like physically, like it is the best like climate up here. Yeah. Um, I think Melbourne being down there the past week, it's just like, I don't know how sustainable that is. Um, the facilities are great in Queensland. Yeah. There's QAS, there's the funding, there's the support staff, there's the, yeah, like the facilities. There's that. And I think it's just like all the big names are here and there's just like a pool factor that's, unlike anywhere else i really hope that you know sydney can get kick-started again because they were pretty good leading into sydney 2000 olympics um I'd, yeah i'd love to see it kind of a bit more diverse but at the same time i'm not complaining because all the competitions up here you know st peter's you know dean dean boxel and chris mooney are like you know their mm. best mates so i'm kind mm. of hoping for a training camp us us two squads together mm. that'd be pretty cool but yeah i'd put it down to the facilities the the staff and the climate. I love the fact that you know your history, mate. You weren't even born in two thousand. You would, you, you don't even know. But uh, when were you born? Two thousand five. Yeah, two thousand five. Wow, wow, jeez, two thousand five. You still, you're still a puppy, mate. You still got a long way to go. Yeah. That's good. You know your history, though. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of the sport. I'm a student of the sport. I just want to, I just want to have memories of myself that you know, I can compare to, you know, something like Thorpe did at the Olympics, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. When you say you're a student of the sport, I think that that's interesting to kind of dig into that a little bit because you are young. You're one of the best swimmers in the world. 
but it seems like again you're you're deep into this thing like this this is very very serious for you and and this is kind of where a lot of athletes your age miss it a little bit you know they they're not they're not students of the sport so what does it mean for you to be a student of the sport well i just have my priorities in line i you know i make the sacrifices and by saying sacrifices they're not really sacrifices for me because right. this is what I want to do. I don't want to go out partying. I don't want to, you know, get a, like, I, do, I don't want to do stuff that takes away from the sport. And people right. call that sacrifices, you know, missing out on, you know, my year 12 formal to be down in Melbourne or missing out on right. graduation or something like that. Right. But that's not a sacrifice for me because I'm doing what I, you know, truly want to do. And that's swim and that's perform the best I can. Yeah. 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 Oh, you get it. You get it early, mate. That's, that's good. Um, that's really good. Uh, what well, what else here? What else have we got here? Where where can you make drops now? I mean, you you went out and you went out in twenty three three back in twenty four four in this hundred forty seven seven. That's it, good, but it, it's not going to win you the race. So no, you know. But there, there's this there's this balance between, like you said earlier, going out too fast, yeah. going out too slow, coming back. To you know, like giving these guys too much room to try and swim over the top. You're not you're not going to swim over the top of Kyle generally 99 percent of the time. So it's like you've either got to be with him or ahead of him, but yeah. not too far behind him. So it's like in in order to win these races, you, you've got to start to play with this a little bit. So what are you thinking? Yeah. So for me, it's not really inventing the wheel. It's just letting that natural progression and the capacity work we do kick in over the next few months um you know i'm still growing i'm still a pretty skinny kid you know i'm not that strong trying to get there but um you know when a lot of people ask like you need to be out faster and it's like yeah i need to be out faster but i don't necessarily need to be out harder you know right right because if i'm out harder and i exert more energy then it takes away from my back end so for me it's like naturally letting that first 50 come to me and how i naturally let it happen is by kicking my ass in training when we have those dive 50s and dive 35s and really increasing that capacity and that ceiling so that when it comes time to race that that capacity is already there i can go out in the same time and spend less energy you know yeah so a progression for me when i went like 48 mid in comparison to when i went 48 two i was out like 23 eight both times but i'd come home 24 7 Mm. 24 8 when i went 48 mid 48 high mm. but then when i came home 48 low i was still out 23 8 so same time and then i was back 24 4 right. right so it kind of is like my back end's getting faster by working that front end you know what i mean yeah yeah do you hit the jets do you hit the jets straight off the wall or do you kind of like come off the wall build into a few strokes and then then really start to bring the legs in what's the philosophy for you um it's about finding that connection first and finding that groove because for me when i try and muscle it and tense up i realize mm. that like a brick doesn't float right right so for me it's about finding that connection and finding that rhythm then really building into it and muscling it i guess um not muscling it being like a mongrel and you know having that kick come in so, so about yeah, so about yeah, probably yeah. like 35 to go you'd say yes yeah, so i'd come off off the wall and you know i'm still going as hard as i can but you know that first you can visibly see when i did the turn off the wall at trials you could see like my arms were just like nice and long and connected for the first like three strokes off that wall and then i just right. started you know breathing right. less and building i want to be like i kind of think to myself be at your fastest velocity by the end of the race it may not actually be that but kind of have that feeling like you're just building through yeah i like that what what about your air are you are you a quick breather like you want to get your air quick and get back into line or are you laying on that trying to get as much air as you can and and mm. and steadier with the head how, how are you incorporating the breathing well i think like my head position dictates my breathing like if i'm looking forward and i try and breathe from there like it just throws my body and aquatic line out heaps mm. so it's kind of about finding that like and even if i like try and take a quick breath it's like i'm like start rushing the stroke and missing that connection but if i'm 
taking a long breath and laying on my arms and my kick becomes like so much more fatigued because it's like I'm sitting in second gear. So it's about, it's for me, I don't really think about whether it's a quick breath or a slow breath or sitting my arms or anything. It's just about finding that flow and like that feeling with the water because, you know, by swimming fast, you have to move through the water fast. Yeah. And I just try and be as streamlined and connected as I can because if you want to get faster, you have to either decrease drag or increase propulsion, you know? Right, right. So just finding that flow for me. What about the the decrease of drag? How how do you go about that? Like, what are you doing with with yeah. your body in the water to decrease it? So, a lot of that comes from the position of my trunk, and then right. you can go to your your extremis, like your fingertips entering the water, and like your mm. kind of kick angle and all that. But something I've worked on really really hard since the start of this year is kind of my hip position in the water. Mm. so when i when i used to breathe i would you know breathe i would be out here but then like my hips would kind of rotate around too much and then mm. if you're thinking like you see like those videos of like the car going through the aerodynamics like if you imagine right. my body like that it's like there's so much water pushing up on like my my hips when they like drop so i've kind of I've stabilized my hips and like i'm rotating through my thoracic and i think that just like one connects my arms a lot better more and two it reduces the drag. So if I pair that up with like a neutral head and my head obviously it moves around a bit more, but in the race, I'm just trying to kind of keep my head on one axis and that's going like that. It's not like looking up and looking around. Like I see so many, like I think David does it pretty big, but that, that might work for him. I've tried that and it doesn't work for me. So if I try and kind of look up and, you know, bounce my head to the side, like that doesn't really work for me. So I'm just, you know, stable and connected. You seem to be a guy that um, studies the tape and and looks at the analytics, but you know you, you come off a, a a bad swim like you say in the two hundred and and you put this pressure on yourself to perform. How much then do you do you throw that out and then move into the psychology? You know, like wh where where's the balance yeah. between looking at like oh I did this and I did that and I got to do this and I got to do that and then just saying just shut up and go. Like wh where's the balance yeah. there? Yeah, that's uh, like some people just don't even realize that you actually have to like shut up, literally like shut up, throw it yeah. out and just move on. Right. So for me, if I have a bad race and even if I have a good race, that's one of my like major philosophies that I like try and mentor to young kids that if you have a bad race or a good race, you give yourself like a timer on your phone, 20 minutes, allow yourself to feel, you know, sad, upset, angry, or feel really happy, excited, over the moon, yeah. cocky, whatever. And then when that timer goes off, it's like, boom, switch back. It's like, okay, I'm Flynn. My next race is 100 free. I'm going to do this, 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 this to recover. I'm going to do this, this, this to mentally prepare. Um, I looked at my stats of the 200 free, like the skills breakdown. I realized my rate was too low. I kind of didn't take it out aggressive enough. Okay. It's like, okay, cool. Learn from it. Move on. Push it away. Right. And that's one of the, the best skills I have. And that's from, you know, having a lots of up and downs a week. Like I know this is me being confident, but I can guarantee that if I have a bad swim and I'm not injured, nothing, like I'm not sick or something, if I just have one bad swim, I can bounce back and have the best swim in my life the next swim because yeah. I'm yeah. resilient. I know that one bad race doesn't define me and that one bad race doesn't mean I'm going to have a bad race of waking um bad week of racing yeah 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 i love it i love it mate that's awesome um in in terms of the racing and uh i mean you, you're obviously going to do a lot more in in training are you going to get any more uh, actual racing in between now and the world championships um probably not i mean we've got like what's the day today tuesday we've got training monday um wednesday morning we've got a bit of gym as well um, the rest of the week, like everyone else on the team kind of takes this week as a bit of a sabbatical and kind of just relax a bit and switch off, kind of go from that alter ego of like Flynn South and the swimmer, the racer of trials to just, you know, I'm a normal teenager. I'm going to go hang out with my girlfriend, go to, you know, the pokies with my mates tonight and <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, not, not like go do anything crazy, but just like enjoy yeah. it and just be a normal teenager. And then at the yeah. end of this week, it's like, okay, your time for celebrating is done get back to it, suit up next week, you know, get lots of kind of training racing in, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, not nothing uh, formal off the blocks. You yeah. know, ra- any 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 racing. Where where are you guys doing your training camp? Where we did our training camp? Where no? Where are you? Where's the Aussie team going? Oh. So we're going to a place called Saka, which I think is an hour or two hour drive from Fukuoka. I'm not too sure on the geography of of Japan, but uh, we've seen photos of the training facility and it looks great. And we're all like, we were watching this like yesterday in the orientation, the presentation, and um, we're all just like, oh, let's go. Like we've got like, I think like two and a half weeks. I think we fly out on not this Saturday, not next Saturday, the Saturday after. So a little under three weeks away. So we're all just kind of frothing at the mouth now. But at the same time, it's like, okay, just got to like less is more this week. It's like recover and mentally freshen up and then get back into it next week. So when you say get back into it and you got three weeks, are you are you trying to make any gains in the next three weeks? Or is it just kind of like you said, get back into it, stabilize, maintain, and then go away? Yeah, well, it's maintaining, it's maintenance at, at the very minimum. Definitely don't want to regress, but, right. you know, it's not like I have to, you know, force myself to do all this extra crazy. Oh, I lost you there for a second. Oh, you Sorry. Got yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just about maintenance and then, you know, yeah. making the stuff that I learned from trials and, you know, putting that back into the training. Yeah. You talked about an alter ego. Do you, do you become someone different when you, or do you feel like you become someone different when you put on the Australian cap? Yeah. Well, for me, it's like you're putting on, I think there's like, we have like this, you would have your pin number. Um, yeah. Like I'm 839. I think there's probably like 850 now dolphins to ever wow. represent Australia. Wow. And I always think of like, you're putting 850 of like our best swimmers ever like you, it's like you're putting on the like the Batman, you're getting in the Batmobile sort of thing and getting yeah. ready to go. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's not like I'll become like a real like snob or something and just tell people get out of my way. I'm racing or hmm. you know just disregard all my friends and that for the week. Like I'm not really like that. I'll just like you know I have my moments where I'll be like okay I got to focus here. But then when racing's done, warm out, warm down's done. It's like okay I can go back to being a normal guy again. Have you been to Japan before? Um, no, I haven't. It's a good spot. It's, it's fun. Um, but, you know, the, the struggles of traveling internationally are uh, kind of like you have to deal with a change, uh, some changes in nutrition. Um, do you have like yeah. set nutrition, things that you have to eat or want to eat before race day? Yeah, I have I definitely have like the stuff, but it's more just about like how much carbs I can get in, how much fat, how much protein, you know, st- stuff like that. But something I've learned over the past few years is that like all the work I've done is not going to be undermined if I have a bowl of ice cream or a bag of chips or something, or if I have, you know, some foreign food, like I've worked too hard to have that work just be undermined by some time, like a little slip up where it's like a choice of having unhealthy right. food or right. whether there's actually like no other food. Like when we are in France last year for staging camp for Com Games, there was literally nothing but baguettes and <laughs> like croissants in the staging yeah. camp, like team room. So I think I lost a few kilos, but I was like, hey, I'm still going to be able to perform. I'm just going to have to perform off bread for a bit, <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah, you figure it out. It is what it is. Just got to deal with it. Make the best move on the chessboard, you know, as some would say. This time it'll be sushi. Mate, trade the baguette yeah. for the sushi. <laughs> I, I love sushi. So for me, that's, that's oh, you're 10 good. out of 10. You're, yeah, you're yeah. good. Well, good stuff, mate. Listen, I appreciate this. I kept you a while. I know that you're, you're probably exhausted uh, physically, mentally, mate. But uh, it's nice getting to know you a little bit. And uh, yeah, yeah nice you're, you're well. not only are you a, a star now, but you're a star of the future, mate. You got a lot of stuff ahead of you, a lot of long career, uh, exciting to watch. So good luck at the worlds, man. And, uh, and, and in your preparation yeah. for, uh, Paris, maybe we'll catch up down the line. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate and appreciate, um, you know, everything you're doing for the sport and trying to grow it a lot more because we need yeah. people like you. Thanks mate. Thanks mate. I'm trying. And, uh, you know, just thank you for saying yes. You know, it's, uh, it only works if people like you say, yeah, you'll do it. So, uh, you know, I asked you a couple of hours ago and you said, yeah, let's, let's jump on now. So, uh, Mate, I appreciate that a lot, but uh, good luck, mate. We're cheering for you, okay? Right. Thank you.
Thanks, Flynn. Take care, mate. Yeah.